I've been asked what about dialectics. People ask me that on YouTube and on Messenger. Well, I've been presenting a series of lectures on materialism. And in a sense, that's exactly what I've been talking about. Materialist dialectics is about the self-development of matter. It's about how atoms create becoming, a direction of time, how they create structure, how they create life. Let me recapitulate. An initial order or symmetry is broken by what Lucretius called the swerve, or what we now call quantum fluctuations. These generate instabilities, which give rise to stars and galaxies. The effect of quantity, vast numbers of atoms, transforms the reversible laws of microscopic mechanics into an arrow of time. Increasing entropy. That is, if you want to look at it this way, the rise of a new quality from quantity. Or the negation sublation of reversible mechanics to give law rise to the law of increasing entropy. But I'm not sure that it's really helpful to use this Hegelian language. If we do, I think we're doing materialism a disservice. Since materialism now has its own language, it has its own concepts, far more sophisticated than and far truer than what you found in Hegel. Don't expect materialist dialectics to just ape the trivialities and sophistry of an idealist philosopher like Hegel. In this talk, I'm going to be going to touch on thermodynamics and the necessity of the rise of life. And following on with that, I'll show how thermodynamics validates Lenin's argument that capitalism arises from and is constantly arising from small-scale commodity production. Matter tends to organise itself into structures or processes that maximise the rate of increase of entropy. Now, animals and flames are two instances of this. This wouldn't have occurred to me spontaneously, but it's something that I came across in Stuart Kaufman's book, The Origins of Order. Think about flames and animals. They both reproduce. They both consume fuel or food. And in a sense they are subject to natural selection. And again, pre-materialist or religious thought attributed them both to divine intervention. Now I said flames are subject to natural selection or fire is subject to natural selection. The point is that flames outcompete smouldering fire. Flames are a, a form of organisation of matter which increases entropy faster than a smouldering fire is. And if you have an initial condition in a forest where you have a small smouldering fire and it eventually gives rise to flame, the flame based fire will outcompete it in the consumption of fuel. But flame also outcompetes animals. Or at least it does if the conditions are right. Under other conditions, when there's not a mass of dry vegetation lying around, deer are a more efficient way at using up the energy in plants and wood and converting this into increased heat, which is increased entropy in the universe as a whole. The problem is, how can something as structured as an animal, or even the flame, reproduce itself? Living things depend on highly ordered structures to survive. They depend on highly ordered polymers, DNA, RNA, or protein chains, which are also polymers. And the order of the bases 
in the DNA. The order of the amino acids in the DNA is important. And the fact that they're polymerized at all, not just floating around as a mass of isolated bases of the DNA. The question then arises, how can structures such a, as this arise in a world of randomly colliding atoms? You get creationists saying, the only answer is that God must have put them together in order. The chances of it happening by random collision of atoms is negligible. Well, it's been hypothesized that you don't need something as complicated as current cells initially. There could have been a simpler form of life that didn't depend on DNA and didn't depend on proteins. This is what archaeobiologists call RNA-based life or the RNA era. Because in principle, molecules of RNA can self-replicate. And if you have something that can self-replicate, then the laws of natural selection take effect. And more importantly than that, RNA has been shown to be able to fold itself into shapes which act as enzymes. So RNA could provide genetic information and it could also provide catalysis, which are the two key things that a cell requires. Now the physicist Jeremy England, who was also trained in biology, has recently analysed the thermodynamics of life and he's been able to show that the formation of such RNA life is favoured by thermodynamics in such a way that at the right temperatures it becomes almost inevitable. The first point to recognise is that in equilibrium thermodynamics it's assumed that chemical reactions are reversible and the equilibrium is reached when the forward and reverse reactions are taking place at the same rate and therefore the concentration of the various compounds stabilizes. Now this would apply to DNA and RNA polymerization as well. So the initial stage of polymerization of nucleic acids involves the bases being bound to phosphate groups. These are then removed or come off and you get a, a binding between the two bases. But this is a reversible process and in principle this phosphate group could move back down and join on there. The issue is, how can a stable structure arise? How can there be a relatively irreversible shift towards order in the RNA? The argument of, Eng of England is that the self-replication of RNA or cells is an irreversible step. And or one directional step, a step which favours one direction. The more irreversible a reaction is, the greater the entropy or heat that must be discarded to the rest of the universe. The more irreversible the process is, the more entropy is produced in polymerization versus degradation. More entropy over the whole universe is produced. The key idea is that relation a chemical reaction takes place which leads to the polymerization. This releases heat. The heat then dissipates into the rest of the universe and is no longer available to fuel the reverse reaction. Now, by a long process of argument, he comes up with a master equation for the process of self-replication, which includes the replication of DNA, RNA, and the replication of whole cells, which is that the amount of heat released to the rest of the universe divided by the temperature, plus 
the change in the internal entropy of the cell that takes place, the internal entropy of the cell or the internal entropy of the DNA, must always be greater than the log of the growth rate of the cell or replicator divided by the decay rate of the cell or replica, replicator. Look up his paper by doing a search on Jeremy England to see the argument for this. But what does that give us? Let's take the issue of stability and energy. DNA is much more long-lived than RNA. That's why we can extract DNA from very old bones, but we can't extract RNA. RNA has a half-life of only about four hours. DNA has a half-life counted in the tens of millions of years. Now, that means the degradation rate is much lower. So this number is much larger and the log is larger. So by England's equ equation, much more heat must be dissipated to construct DNA than to construct RNA. The, the equation shows that whilst it's energetically possible for self-replicating RNA to arise spontaneously, he shows that the energetics are favourable, that the chemical reaction that forms RNA, when you fit it into that equation, shows that this is a process which should spontaneously occur. On the other hand, spontaneously self-replicating DNA can't arise spontaneously. It can only arise after cells have developed to harness energy from other sources, since the long-lived DNA requires additional energy to be released in its formation. What's more, his equation turns out to reasonably accurately predict not only the energy usage of DNA and RNA formation. It also predicts the energy used by bacteria in order to replicate. It predicts the amount of energy that E. coli, the minimum amount of energy that an E. coli would have to use up to replicate. And the actual figures that he predicts shows that the minimum energy is about 40% of the actual measured energy, which shows that the bacteria are actually remarkably efficient in their use of energy. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, we have a series of stages. You have the random swerve or quantum fluctuations giving rise to galaxies, etc., which we get from Epicurus and Lucretius. We have reversible random motion giving rise to the arrow of time and the increase of entropy from Boltzmann. And we have that the maximization of disorder gives rise to its opposite, the order of life, which comes from the chain of, of reasoning started by Darwin and completed by English. If this isn't materialist dialectics, what is?